Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. In Lecture 8C, we're going to talk about how to do genetic analysis. The first thing is to realize that textbook problems were actually developed to simulate the kind of thinking that you would do in a real research situation. They're not just made up to torture students. The strategy is to solve them like they were a detective story come up with various ideas. Was it the butler in the bedroom? Was it the parlor maid in the pantry? And test these hypotheses against the information that you're given. Well, no, it couldn't have been the butler in the bedroom because the butler never left the parlor. And if your hypothesis doesn't explain the data, try another hypothesis. So it's not like solving other kinds of science problems. There's no what the physics students refer to as plug and chug, where you say, oh, it's this kind of problem. I just get this formula. I put this number in here. I multiply this by this, and out pops the answer. In genetics problems, generally, there aren't general recipes for finding the answers. Some simple problems that are show up repeatedly in genetics textbooks, have standard approaches, and you'll find these approaches presented as um, recipes for how to solve this kind of problem, um, sometimes on websites giving genetics hints. But you'd have to know already that the problem that you have falls into this particular type. And you can be pretty sure that the problems you'll see in this course won't fall into types where you can just follow the recipe to get the right answer. In this case, you're always going to have to think your way through the problem. Typically, solving a genetics problem requires you to figure out some components, some combinations of the following. You have to think about genotype components, about inheritance, what happens when alleles pass from the parents to the offspring? And there's, of course, two parts to this. There's meiosis in both parents. So you have to be able to figure out what gamete genotypes and frequencies are produced from what parental genotypes. Or sometimes you have to work backwards and say, what parental genotypes could have produced these gametes? And then you also have to think about fertilization, how maternal and paternal gametes come together to produce the next generation. So you have to be able to predict the genotypes of the offspring and their frequencies. And the third component is phenotype. You have to know which alleles or which combinations of alleles cause which phenotypes. All of these are things that you might get clues from the problem statement. You may get some of this information from the problem, and the rest of it you have to figure out as a kind of puzzle. Now, here's a sort of a schematic drawing of how to go about solving these problems. You start with the data, what the question tells you, and you come up with a simple hypothesis, some simple explanation that could possibly explain the data. And you want to start with something simple. Don't make it complicated. And then you try your idea out. Well, if this was true, is it consistent with the data? Does it explain the data? And if it doesn't, you don't say, oh, I'm a failure. I'm a terrible geneticist. I'll never do these well. You say, huh. Okay, it wasn't the butler in the bedroom. Try another hypothesis. Modify your hypothesis in the light of what you've learned by figuring out that your first idea couldn't be true. Because finding out that your idea can't be true isn't a failure. You've made an advance. You've learned more about the problem. Use that information to try and improve your hypothesis or change it or throw it out and try a different one. Try that one again. Does it explain the data? If it does, you might think, oh, hooray, I'm done. But actually, you're not. Because you need to know, are there other explanations that could also explain the data? In particular, might these other explanations be simpler? If not, then you're done. So let's put this scheme into practice. Here's a problem involving purebred dogs. Now, purebred, as applied to dogs, or related terms, 
pure breeding, true breeding, applied to many different species, means an organism that's been inbred to the point where it's homozygous and all the alleles that matter. So if you're told an organism, for instance, these dogs is, are purebred, you can assume that they're going to be homozygous for whatever loci matter in this problem. Different purebred breeds will have different alleles at the loci that distinguish the breeds. So in this problem, you cross a purebred Dalmatian dog, their black spots on a white background, with a purebred Labrador who's black. All seven of the puppies are black. And you mate these offspring later with eat when they grow up with each other, giving 27 pop puppies, tw 20 of which are black and seven are spotted. And what you're asked to do is to explain the inheritance of coat color. That means how many genes there are, what are the alleles of these genes, um, how do these alleles control the phenotype. So let's start by picking a simple hypothesis. Which one do you want? And I think we will go with what the first hypothesis says. We're going to assume that there's, this is explained by there being one gene controlling color, and it's got two alleles, big B and little b. And we can pull this hypothesis apart of it, explain it more to ourselves. The parents are homozygous, so the bl black Labrador is going to be big B, big B. We've used B, capital B, and little b. This means we're assuming a dominance relationship. Because the puppies are all black, we'll assume that capital B means black, and little case B, B in this case gives you white with spots. So the black parent is homozygous capital B, the spotted Dalmatian is homozygous little b. And it's very easy to predict what the genotype and phenotype of the puppies are going to be. This is the kind of Punnett square that only has one side, one, one compartment. All the gametes from the black Labrador are big B. All the gametes from the Dalmatian are little b. All the puppies are big B, little b. So that, and our hypothesis says that big B is dominant to little b, so those puppies will all be black. So far so good, this hypothesis explains the first generation. Now let's think about the second generation. In this, the prediction, what do we predict for the second generation? Well, the parents, the puppies from the first generation, are all big B, little b. They're black. So the next generation is going to be a quarter big B, little b, a half big B, little b, and a quarter little b, little b. And we can draw a quick Punnett square just to confirm that I did it right. So the parents are big B, little b. Their gametes are going to be half big B, half little b. The offspring are going to be big B, big B, little b, little b, and the heterozygotes. And because we know that big B is dominant and causes black, we know that all of these puppies will be black. And these puppies should be spotted under our hypothesis. So that's our prediction. If our hypothesis is right, that's what we should see. What did the cross produce? Well, it produced 27 puppies, 20 black, and 7 spotted. OK, how does that compare with our hypothesis? Well, it compares pretty well. 20 out of 27 is very close to 3 quarters, and 7 out of 27 is very close to 1 quarter. So it's looking good, but not so fast. Let's go back to our scheme. So according to our scheme, we're here. We have a hypothesis that explains the data. It's consistent with all the data. But we haven't considered the alternatives. Might another hypothesis also explain the data? Well, or would it be more complicated? So 
let's go back to the other hypotheses that we had when we started the problem. I offered you four hypotheses. Let's look at them a little more critically. So the first one said one gene, alleles big B, little b. That one fits. The second one says one gene, alleles B1 and B2. Well, that one fits too. We just have to say B1 is dominant to B2. So that's essentially the same hypothesis, but with less information in it. It's a, a weaker version of the same hypothesis. And we always want the most specific hypothesis that we can that explains the data. And that's this one better than this one. What about this hypothesis? Three alleles, big B, B prime, and little b. Well, there could be a B prime allele, but it's not in our dogs. It might be in some other dogs. It might control other aspects of inheritance, but we don't need it to explain the inheritance in the dogs in this problem. So that hypothesis isn't wrong, but it's more specific than is just the needs to be for the data. The second one says, well, there's two genes. There's a big B, little b gene, and there's an S gene as well. Well, there might be an S gene, but it's not needed to explain the phenotypes in this problem. This is the simplest explanation. And you should always choose the simplest explanation that provides the most explanation of the actual data. And there's a principle here, and it's called Occam's razor. And it's originally specified in Latin, because William of Occam lived in the Middle Ages. But the basic principle is, don't make your explanations any more complicated than they need to be to explain your data. That doesn't guarantee that your hypotheses will be right, but it saves you from getting into a lot of confusion by working with hypotheses that are too complicated. So always abide by this principle. Make your hypothesis only as complicated as it needs to be to explain your data. And always favor the simplest hypothesis that explains the data. So what we've done so far, I took you through a sort of general strategy for solving um, genetic analysis problems. We applied it to one genetics problem, and then we applied Occam's razor to the problem, eliminating the explanations that were more complicated than our data required. Coming up next, we've still got our Dalmatian. We're now going to do a more complicated problem. I hope to see you there.